Hello and welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. We have another participatory program for you this time. We're going to be exploring different techniques of meditation. It's a return visit for Helen Palmer, a psychologist, and clairvoyant. Helen, before we start, are there any things that listeners should do or have ready to prepare them for what we're about to talk about? No, you need to get your body into a comfortable position with your feet on the floor and your spine relatively straight. And uh, one of the uh, great reminding factors in meditation is the posture of the body, which is very simple to, to work with. And all you have to remember is to keep the spine straight and to tuck the chin slightly so that your um, head doesn't come off center or off line as you begin to go deeper into the meditative state. Other than that, um, if you're hungry or if you're overly cold, your room is overly cold, or if you're sleep deprived, then your meditation will simply consist of being hungry, cold, or tired. <laughs> but uh, if you're in a good position on those fronts and your body is relatively comfortable, that's all you need. You don't need a soft, cushy chair, though. In fact, that probably doesn't help too much. Well, we're not uh, working in the old traditional practices of deprivation. Uh, usually, when one learns how to meditate, little by little, um, a load is put on, like you go without sleep or you go uh, uh, without food for certain periods of time in order to uh, present an mm -hmm. obstacle to the meditation so that you have something to... Um, uh, shift attention away from into state of emptiness or into state of focusing, which are the meditative states of mind. Uh, but uh, these reminding factors like uh, the body, the posture, breath, hunger, cold, those things, are simply introduced periodically as um, assists to the meditation. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. What is it, meditation? Well, for me, it's always been uh, the ability to shift attention away from what are called the ordinary states, like uh, internal uh, objects of attention, emotions, thoughts, memories, fantasies, those kinds of things, and to be able to shift the attention into the other uh, states of mind that are usually dominated and overshadowed by our ordinary thinking state. So in those uh, other states of mind, which we really think to explore, unless there is some uh, pressure coming from thoughts or from emotions, something that we would like to reduce, like um, pressure in emotional states or thoughts that have become compulsive or that we would like to get away from. Usually the pressure to get away from ourselves moves us into the altered state, into meditative state. Or uh, inspiration. Uh, in the old cultures, the, uh, the possibility of being inspired by, by what we used to call a saint or a holy person would have um, moved someone into following a meditative practice. What about the major forms of meditation? What are they? There are two historical lines of meditation, and uh, one of them is the most familiar, I think, in the West, emptying practices. And that's the shift of attention from ordinary states of emotion and thought into a state of relative quiet and emptiness where thoughts and emotions are not pressing. Uh, pressing. Uh, the emptying practices collectively are called Vipassana, and one of those practices is Zen, which is a very popular Western uh, practice introduced relatively recently. The emptying practices have the, as their goal the ability to shift attention to an empty object. So they take the breath, which is a repeating physiological object of attention and has no uh, particular form. It's not a thought, it's not a memory, it's not an emotion, it's not a physical sensation, it's an empty object. So in emptying, we use that as the focusing device, emptiness. So uh, someone might question, well, why would one want to become empty? Like, what's the functional use of that or the value of that? And it was held to be um, a kind of a medicine, a way of reducing the suffering in a thinking state or the suffering of repetitive emotions. So we in the West, who are quite plagued with those things and heavy in our ego state, uh, we're, we're grateful for those techniques, that ancient technology that will help us enter into a relative state of quiet. It's restabilizing, it's medicinal in a sense, and the emptying practices uh, are usually um, Buddhist in origin, northern Buddhist, and the uh, one that we know best, as I said, is Japanese Zen. Another kind of uh, practice, focusing practice. These are uh, uh, collectively um, practiced by the southern Buddhists, by uh, Tibetans, by um, uh, what we would call so-called primitives that follow animistic practices. 
Focusing practices had as their goal, again, a shift of attention from ordinary thinking and emotional state into uh, being able to focus on the qualities of energy that were seen to be um, operating in uh, part of the essential realm, part of what it was closer to God. The goal was to embody these qualities as a side effect from those practices of trying to visualize or focus attention on the aspects of God, the side effect was that psychic or um, other unusual abilities tended to appear as a byproduct or as a side effect of the ability to focus attention in these non-thinking states. The, uh, the psychic or the intuitive um, capacities that developed as a side effect were not really seen as valuable in and of themselves in the ancient traditions. We in the West are much more interested in cultivating them. In the uh, ancient traditions, they were not seen as important in and of themselves. So, of course, we're Westerners, and we, uh, we are goal-oriented, and we want to get the goods. So we perform practices in order to develop these psychic or these intuitive abilities. But uh, traditionally, these are side effects and not to be cultivated. And uh, the focusing practices simply take a, an object of concentration rather than an empty object like the breath. They take a focal object. So it's the attaching rather than the detaching of attention toward a focal object. And the object uh, is usually something repetitive, again, something that you can always catch if you lose your meditation. You can always return to it. You can always attach your attention back to this internal repeating focal point. And the traditional ones are mantra, which is a set of uh, syllables uh, that you intone in the um, interior of your mind. Uh, visualization, which is the production of a, a visual object, such as in a dream, like a dream object. And um, let's see, mantra, uh, visualization, I guess those are the two major ones that we're okay. familiar with. When we see people in public meditating, and on occasion we do, the, the first thing that would come to the non-meditative Western mind is that that person is praying What's mm -hmm. the difference, the traditional difference, between meditating and praying? Oh, there's a big difference. Uh, not to demean the power of prayer at all, but prayer would be an entrance into meditation in this sense. Prayer operates in the thinking state. One thinks one's prayer. Uh, you can say it out loud, mm -hmm. or you can say it internally. But in the thought statements, or if you're saying it out loud w uh, with your voice, it's a, uh, a known prayer, a memorized prayer, so it exists in your memory, and it operates from your thinking state. So what you're trying to do is shift your attention to the highest possibility that the thinking state is capable of, to attach your thoughts to God, so to speak, or the higher self, uh, higher than ordinary thinking. Uh, so praying has, uh, it doesn't imply a shift of attention into an altered state at all. It operates from a thinking, from, a, from an ordinary state. Meditation is something else. It's to open up the, uh, to make available states of mind that are overshadowed by thinking, that exist and are possible for people to, ordinary people like ourselves, to reach, but that we rarely can access in any kind of repeating or uh, voluntary way unless we perform a practice. And meditation is a practice that teaches that shift of attention into the other states of mind that are usually overshadowed by thought. So the first task of meditation is to get past the thought barrier. So prayer could, in fact, be a preface to meditation. Absolutely. And I'm thinking of a litany or some Absolutely. long, uh, remembered, repetitive kind of mm -hmm. thing. That could almost function as a mantra. Yes, it can. Uh, but it does. D a long, repetitive litany also depends a great deal on your memory. So you're rather located in the, the ordinary state just by the proscription of remembering the litany. So that's, uh, that's one problem with it. Some people have a, a very difficult time. Um, they give meditation... Uh, couple of tries and say it's not that's not cut out for me mm -hmm. because they have a difficult time focusing or emptying the yes. two uh, practices yes. that you're talking about are some people just more talented than others when it comes to meditation well i i, I don't see so much as talent as, pr as pressure uh, some people uh, you know can learn how to meditate put it on the shelf and then in in a time of pressure or a time when they become converted in other words they uh, they are re-inspired you might say they might take it back again as a practice I think timing uh, has a great deal to do with it. The, the reason that I entered a meditational practice was because of necessity, not through you know, any great desire to reach God at the beginning of things or to uh, tap into higher abilities, and that was uh, not in my mind at all. It was simply to reduce the pressure of my thoughts 
and my emotions, which have become painful. And I think if the pressure is there, if someone experiences that kind of pressure, they're very willing to move into these states because it's helpful. It's restabilizing. You can do it yourself. It doesn't cost anything. It's an extremely helpful method. If you only see it on a kind of medicinal level, it has its uses. Uh, without those kinds of, um, of pressures, the time to put in, uh, without uh, an effect, in the West it's very hard if we don't have an effect. If we don't feel a reduction of tension or we don't feel that we're achieving something, it's hard for us to continue. Is contemplation a form of meditation? Yes. Contemplation uh, is, is simply the shifting of attention onto a focal object. So in that sense, it can be highly meditative insofar as the thoughts and the other emotions are suspended at the time the contemplation goes on. Okay. Let's see if we can't uh, move into one of the, the techniques that you discussed. Well, the first thing you should do is to uh, place yourself in a comfortable position with your feet uh, flat on the floor if you're using a chair or in a, a non-pressured uh, position if you're sitting cross-legged like on a, a zafu or a sitting cushion. And now we'll, we'll begin with the emptying practice, and the purpose of this is to be able to shift attention to a state of relative emptiness. So first, wherever you are, you should locate your attention as best you can. For most of us, attention is frontal. Please close your eyes and recognize where your attention is located. And probably what you have is something about the back of your eyelids, something uh, black and sort of ruddy, your attention looking at the back of your eyelids. If your eyes were open, you would see the room again, but right now your eyes are closed. You also have some uh, kind of memory of the floor and the ceiling and the objects in the room in front of you. Those are external objects, things you hear through your ears <coughs> or you would see through your eyes if your eyes were open, external objects of attention. There are also internal objects which surface as you get deeper into the meditative state. These are of several kinds, memories. So please just shift your attention and occupy your attention with a real memory in your life, like something you did last week. Just do the memory in whatever way it comes to you. And now for some people, the memory is like a thought statement. For some, it's an image an image remembrance, and for some it's a combination. But we're not investigating how you do the memory, just that you know your attention is located in the past, in your real past. So shift your attention to a memory. Now, with your eyes still closed, please shift your attention to something in the future, planning, something you're going to do next week. So attention is occupied next week in a plan. Now we know something about attention, that it shifts. And this doesn't take us by surprise since we shift attention all the time without concerning ourselves with that. In meditation, specific shifts of attention are most important. And this is how we can discriminate, how we can tell where our attention is located, by shifting it from one to another of the internal functions. So far we have two. A third internal function, fantasy. This is a personal object projected from the self. Let's all do the same fantasy. So I'll suggest we do beach scene. Now just let your attention play it out however it wants to beach scene. So in my beach scene I have something about water and a few dunes and some guys with a beach ball. This is a fantasy projected from myself. In psychology we would call this a guided image where thought, beach scene, directs a personal little reverie, fantasy, which carries out the direction. Directed image, guided image, there are two other internal objects, judging thoughts and doubting thoughts. And uh, this is part of the decision-making process that we use many, many times a day. It's ordinary thinking state. 
the mind proposes an idea. For example, I said beach scene, and you had a little fantasy of a beach scene. Thoughts in reaction to the beach scene would have been of two kinds, judging in the sense of was it good or bad, how you did the beach scene, doubting, such as is this real, maybe I'm making the whole thing up, am I doing it correctly? Judging and doubting thoughts, part of the decision-making process where the mind proposes, in this case a beach scene, and then thoughts judge or doubt. This is how we think in dualistic in the dualistic realm, we propose and then we reevaluate. Those are the internal objects of attention belonging to the mental body. In a sense, those are the only intrusions that you can expect in your meditation coming from those categories. Now, if you understand them as categories, they don't press you so heavily. Like an individual judging thought or doubting thought, it doesn't matter so much if we realize it's just a category of my mind. And what we are trying to do in principle is to shift attention away from thought altogether. So we have memory, go to a memory. Planning, shift to a plan. Now please shift attention to a guided image, beach scene. It's a fantasy. Now judge it. Now doubt it. A second realm of possible interferences in the shift of attention toward emptying and emptying practice, emotional reactions. These usually come from the kind of meditator who is an emotional being, where when you sit for even very few minutes, like say 15 minutes, the energy that is usually required to think or to feel or to walk around the block three times, those avenues of using energy are contained within the meditation. You're sitting and you're emptying your attention of those usual habits. Consequently, when energy starts to pile up or you start to recognize that you've been sitting for a time without an object of attention, the emotive type where the intrusions from the emotional body are most prominent will tend to have emotional reactions. These will be either for the meditation, like, oh, how exciting, or against it, like, I feel trapped and I don't want to do this anymore, I'm bored. Either way, you recognize, you notice intrusion from the emotions. You don't take it seriously because you recognize that if you pay attention to the emotions, like if you paid attention to an intrusion from the mind, you would lose your meditation. Your attention would be stolen by one of the usual habits from ordinary thinking state. So emotional reactions are of two kinds, positive and negative, and for this time of meditation, they're both off. The third form of intrusion is very obvious, comes from the physical body like your left knee or the floor underneath your feet all of a sudden becomes vastly interesting in the meditation. Any kind of uh, physical pain obviously presents an intrusion. In terms of this practice of emptying, one notices all intrusions but pays attention to none. The principle behind emptying is not to block out thought or stonewall emotions, or keep away your left knee or the floor under your feet. The idea in emptying practice is to accept whatever comes, notice it, but immediately shift attention away from those habits and back to a referent point, which in this case is the empty breath in the abdomen. The deepest part of the body, as far away from the head and from the emotions as possible, you take as an object of interest the rising and falling of the empty breath. Now I'm going to lead you through the shift of attention from its ordinary state to taking as a reference point the empty object deep in the body and just learning how to stay with that and to notice all intrusions but paying attention to none of them. Okay, now with your eyes closed Again, notice where your attention is located. If it's still 
in the up position in the head behind the eyelids, somewhat being plagued by the thoughts that uh, come and go. Notice, collect your attention, and drop your attention way down deep into your body, past the heart. Keep shifting the attention down, past the diaphragm, until you arrive at the deep part of the abdomen below the navel. And as you take an abdominal breath, if you increase it slightly, you'll feel against the interior of the abdominal wall a pressure point. In Japanese Zen, this is called the Hara point. In Sufism, it's the Kath point. In many of the other traditions, it has a different word, but it's always the same body point. Now, as you take the abdominal breath, just increase it slightly, and you'll feel like a 50 cents worth of space on the inside of the interior wall of the abdomen. This is the place where breath, abdominal breath, and attention meet. Interesting that it's not over your left hip somewhere or on your right knee. There is a point where attention and breath meet. So find that point, and I'll leave you alone for a little while. Keep dropping attention to the deep abdomen, to the place in the abdomen where attention and breath meet. Now it's not necessary to speed or to slow your breath, but it is important that your attention locate in that place. Now you'll notice, even after half a minute, that attention wants to shift into its habits. Thoughts come, or feelings, or physical intrusions. Whatever arises inside of you, you notice it, and let it go, and relocate, shift your attention back to the rising and falling of the breath deep in the abdomen. Just observe breath and notice everything, but accept nothing. Have you failed if the uh, itch on your left leg becomes so overpowering that you must reach down to, to scratch it? You failed if you use the energy that you're preserving in meditation, if you want to use the word failure. In meditation, you always just come back to the object. You just can't, it's, you're always going to breathe, so you always can come back again. But if you notice the itch, it's hard not to notice it. It becomes a very important uh, focal device. Then you have two points of attention, the breath and the itch. And you would notice the breath and return the, I'm sorry, notice the itch and return back to the breath. Notice it as it comes in, the itch, go back to the breath. So it becomes a very steady reference point. This is part of the principle behind uh, one form of pain control. Say the itch were um, a mending broken limb or something that gave a, a lot of pain, it's always there. So by using this practice of shifting attention away from it, you see, it reduces the amount of pain because you're not paying attention to it. And it becomes a part of the meditation itself. Yes, and it goes into the background of your attention. The pain goes into the background while the breath comes into the foreground. It's a way of suspending the pain. You know. But no, there's no failure in, in meditation. It's not like a pass-fail situation. You, you either relieve your attention of the the pervasity of thoughts and emotions, or you don't, but it's not a failure in any sense. How long does it last? 
I beg your pardon? <laughs> How long does it last? You mean the effects of meditation, like a pill? No, the actual, the practice itself. Um, you, oh, if you oh. have, do, it, <laughs> is it okay if you know you've only got five minutes between oh, stops yeah. on the train? Or if you've got uh, an hour and a half to kill on the bus mm -hmm. to Reno. Or well, usually you, you need to, to verify for yourself, why are you going to Reno in a meditative <laughs> I don't <know>. state? I just <laughs> You're going to play the machines. I know you are machines, in, in yeah. a meditative state. You're going to win on the machines. But uh, no, the, um, my, med my meditation teacher, my uh, old Zen teacher, uh, and I think it's so, he used to say, first you have to establish your practice. You have to verify that you, in fact, can produce this state. And then, uh, once it's established, then five minutes is fine as long as it's mindful. You decide. I go in, I drop completely and empty, I shift completely, and then I come right back again. Mm -hmm. But if you're in there fighting because it's only five minutes, then uh, there's no meditation. Okay. <laughs> what uh, might I expect to um, realize as the result of a meditative practice? There's a tremendous restabilization in uh, the psychological state that appears. The, uh, the ability to, to know that you are not plagued by your thoughts, to be able to shift attention away from thoughts and away from problems, gives a tremendous amount of personal control over life. Those issues don't press so strongly. For that reason alone, it's very beneficial to Westerners. Dr. Burrell Payne, who was a recent guest here on Infinity, uh, is involved with something called the Global Meditation Project, and he believes that if enough people all over the Earth meditate at about the same time, they could actually affect the electromagnetic field around the Earth. Well, I, I have absolutely no argument with that. Uh, my, my task in, uh, in my own life is simply to introduce people to the practice that's the best for them and to work with um, being able to stabilize their attention in some form of non-thinking state. The superior effects of that, like a mass of meditators, uh, I certainly subscribe to those views, but it's not my interest. My interest is just in individuals and what they can achieve in their own lives through these states. What about the individual who says, I'm pretty passive already. Um, I don't get involved. I don't raise my hand in class. I don't really uh, strike up conversation with strangers, even mm -hmm. though I'd like to. There's something deep down in me. Now I'm going to get into meditation, and I'm really going to shrink out of the world. I'm going mm. to just draw within myself and disappear. That's a possibility, uh, which I wouldn't deny. For some, uh, what you'd call a, a withdrawn or schizoid or avoidant type, it would, it would not, uh, which I don't think you are, by the way, Charlie. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> You appear much too plucky uh, for that category, <laughs> but the uh, if in fact you were w one of those uh, one of those uh, categories of mind, a, a different kind of meditation, a more active or involved meditation, also uh, shifting attention away from thinking where the problem of avoidism or uh, withdrawal might be located. So we would like to be able to remove attention from that habit, but a different practice might be advisable. And uh, my Zen teacher also was very, uh, very clear with that. You know, for some people, it's counterproductive in their 20s or in their early 30s to be, you know, looking at the wall in a uh, traditional monastic setting. It can be a withdrawal from problem rather than going into life and solving it. You see, so you have to use these practices with a certain amount of common sense. This is also one of my greatest fear for the transperson transpersonal psychological movement is that we're going to uh, somehow uh, give meditations by prescription you know, rather than uh, realizing what is necessary for an individual in the way of centering or focusing their attention in the way that's best for their life. Mm -hmm. So if you were a withdrawal type, you might take a different kind of meditation. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening. <laughs>